Okay, sorry, I, I just hate working with Max. Um, um, sorry to disappoint that there will be no extravagantly provocative statements today. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very low-key kind of focused talk on, some, on an idea that is just in the beginnings of me understanding it. Um, and it's not exactly what my abstract is on either, because I realized that I was trying to do two things in this presentation, and one of them was of interest only to people who are fascinated with epistemological questions about the relationship between theories and, and facts, and, and I'm sure that's very few of you. So what this, what this is really about today um, is about um, the question of understanding and reducing violence in South Africa and linking that to understandings and identities, which, which um, is something that I sort of walked into by accident. Now, this is part of a very, very slow series um, that happens at the rate of like 15 minutes a year at the ISS conferences. Um, and it, it goes back to um, a theoretical argument that I've been developing around the need to um, focus on violence reduction rather than simply criminal justice in South Africa. Okay? And people like Alt Becker have made very strong arguments that, that we need to think about crime in South Africa in terms of its, of its violent nature rather than in terms of its prevalence. Um, and also, um, my own work moves away from really um, framing um, violent prevention in terms of, of, of law enforcement. I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in the law enforcement aspect, but more as a social scientist in the psychosocial kind of underpinnings of, of violence. Um, the other thing that that's, is, is at work in my wanting to separate um, sort of law enforcement and violence is the interesting issue that, uh, that, that most violence actually isn't criminalized. There's a whole lot of violence that goes on that, that, that is, does not fall under the rubric of law breaking. Um, and uh, an argument that I've made previously um, was the idea that the the, the forms of violence that, that, that we not only don't criminalize, but don't sanction socially, that we think are kind of acceptable and useful and, and normalized into everyday life, are actually linked to the other forms of violence that we do get stressed about and that we do um, then engage in things like criminal prosecution or various other social sanctions. Okay, so that's, that's the context, is a shift on to, to violent prevention. Okay, um, and immediately when we start looking at that, we start realizing that uh, the sort of criminal justice approach tends to rely on um, the idea of deterrence through punishment as its primary violence prevention strategy. And that's, that's also not what I find especially interesting for my own work. Um, and the thing is that that doesn't only happen within that system, it, it's used widely in, as, as a form of social control. For instance, used widely in parenting, um, in negotiating relationships, in negotiating uh, sexual encounters even. Um, the, this, the, 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 the resorting to violence as a way of, of, um, of, of actually deterring certain other kinds of violence seems to create this very complex loop where we're not clear in our own minds whether violence is the, is the solution or the problem. There seems to be a kind of a circularity um, going on. And I've, I've mapped that stuff out in a, in, a, in a paper a while ago called Violence is Not a Crime, which if, if you want to know how that argument works, that's, that's in the Crime Quarterly a couple of editions ago. Um, instead, what I'm interested in doing now is, um, is really doing preventative work around violence um, and, and, and looking at, um, at um, addressing the underlying causes of violence. Um, and, and most of us are, are very familiar with the, the, the range of approaches there, the kind of historical, sociological, economic, psychosocial um, approaches. I'm not going to try and unpack them all um, because they, um, they, they're, they're pretty familiar material. Um, but the point I want to make out of that is uh, to, to focus that quite narrowly on the question of the relationship between facts and values and identity. And I'm going to, in this talk, actually avoid the question of the relationship between theories and facts. Um, but to say a couple of things, thanks to the, a lot of people at this conference, we know 
a lot about what is happening in terms of violence. There, there isn't really a great shortage of research data. There's, 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 there's a variety of robust data. Um, the, the weakness, it seems, uh, at the moment is in the theoretical integration of that data into systems of understanding. And, it, and, and that weakness happens at two levels. Um, to some extent, it happens at, at the kind of theoretical academic formulation. To a greater extent, it happens in the translation of that academic formulation into policy formulations. But the point where it really breaks down catastrophically is in the, the connection between that data and popular understandings of violence and what needs to be done about it. Um, and all of this seems to rest on a kind of a, 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 an, a, an assumption which is just plain wrong as far as I can see. That, um, that knowing the facts will lead us to understand the problem and that understanding the problem will lead us to ha having effective interventions. And I think if that were true, the effective interventions would be in place, and I think the data shows that they're not uh, yet. Um, so to jump over the question of the way in which the theoretical act, um, framing of the thing actually shapes what kind of things we consider as facts, I want to jump over to the, to the, to the next point, which is what I actually want to talk about today, is the way in which we understand violence is not primarily derived from uh, factual data that has been produced by researchers, but has been derived from emotional experience and the way our identities have been constructed in terms of um, uh, things that have impacted on us developmentally. Okay, So rather than, than thinking that these understandings are, are rational and, and evidence-based, I want to argue that they are experiential and identity-based. Um, and why is that important? Okay, um, and my argument about why is it important has to do with the question of populism and populism uh, in in both law enforcement and in in violence prevention. And it seems to me one of the interesting things that goes on in the world is this tension between kind of critical cl criminology and 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 populism around what needs to be done. About, about threats of violence, about threats of criminality. And there seems to be a kind of a consistent pattern of popular support for, for kind of aggressive and repressive policing, for highly punitive uh, criminal justice responses, and for moves to, to kind of upscale both private security and community vigilantism as responses to, to the perceived problem of violence. Um, and the, 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 the tension there is, is really in the sense that it's, it's known that those populist responses actually escalate rather than de-escalate problems of violence. I think they, I mean, it's, I hope there's consensus around the fact that, that those, those responses don't work. Um, so instead what, what um, I'm trying to understand at the moment is the way in which those emotional um, responses uh, uh, are, are created the way they, they're, they're based on imagined threats and the way they produce these kind of feelings of emotional vulnerability and expressions of anger that are actually behind the kind of populist ideologies of um, sort of tough on crime, um, getting rid of violence and criminality in society. Um, and what's linked to that is uh, something that I also talked about previously um, in, in that um, Violence is Not a Crime paper, which is the normalization of the use of violence to deal with emotionally stressful experiences. And by, what I mean by this is the way in which, in, in, a, in a variety of situations, whether it's you know, being upset that, that, that someone else is taking your job or that getting stressed that your children are misbehaving or being afraid that burglars are going to break into your house and rape you, all of those kind of anxieties actually seem to popularly lead people to want to resort to acts of defensive violence in order to protect themselves from those things. And, and it seems to me that just that little loop is, is very, very interesting and needs more examination. Um, but what this paper is really about is, a, is about a course that I taught called Representing Violence, where something unexpected happened that I'm trying to understand. Because initially what I was trying to do is I, want, I, I thought there's a need for expertise around violence in South Africa. And so what I would do is I'd create an academic course where I teach students what the current research findings and major theoretical explanatory frameworks were. 
and that would then create experts who'd be able to go out into the field and, 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 uh, and work on interventions. Um, and the interesting thing is that that's not really what happened. Something else started happening that, was, that I hadn't planned that was more interesting, is that stuff started happening at the level of the, the kind of emotional experiences and identity constructions of the students in the courses. They started understanding themselves and the experience of the world in new and different ways that were actually both very upsetting to them and also um, they then came to experience as being kind of very empowering. Um, and it's that sort of paradox of, of being distressed and being empowered that started becoming quite interesting. Um, so what started happening is um, as they started b becoming aware that certain of the, the, their beliefs about the sort of factual state of violence in South Africa were wrong, like for instance that, 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 that we can't say that there's been a, a um, um, uh, linear increase in violence over the last 20 years. That's just factually uh, un uh, unsubstantiated. Um, and that the situation is more complicated. Combining that with reframing violence in certain ways, instead of it just seeing this as a kind of pathological acts of, of social deviance, um, and instead looking at the way in which it's um, something that is, that is structured into a very wide variety of behavior of, of um, people within South African society, um, that they started sort of challenging not only the received definitions of violence um, that they'd grown up with, but also the way in which violence had been normalized into um, their own lives in certain kind of non-criminalized ways. Um, so what started happening there is instead of, um, of, of, of just understanding the, the, the data and the theoretical interpretations of it, um, these, the, this, this, something else started becoming thematic in the experience of the course, which is students starting to foreground their own experiences as, as survivors of violence. Now, normally we would assume that only very few of the students were, in fact, survivors of violence. And the, one of the interesting findings is that, that, in fact, almost all of them were. I mean, there, there's a negligible number that hadn't experienced um, several forms of violence of various kinds. Um, and then, and, and this shift towards identifying themselves as having had those experiences and then uh, learning to recognize their own, their own emotional responses to it. And the fact that those often weren't, sometimes they were like explicitly criminal um, victimization, but, but very often they weren't. Very often there were these other kinds of normalized um, experiences of violence. Um, meant that they could start understanding the way their own emotions were shaped by formative traumatic experiences and understanding the way in which things they experienced as threats, like the threats of criminal violence, um, were, were actually um, quite personal emotional responses to interpretations of ideas of what were, were, were going on that weren't actually supported by, by the research. Um, what was what was really interesting here is that this triggered a fundamentally transformative process in the students. And not only did they become aware of, of um, um, more far-reaching theoretical interpretations and new empirical data, they also started relating emotionally differently to the problems. And, and, and this what is what seems to me to be what is interesting about this, this experience is that as they, they, they started identifying those experiences, the, the, one of the main things that broke down is a dichotomy between them as, as potential victims in a dangerous society and then an outsider group of perpetrators of, of violence. That, that, that started imploding and they started realizing that they were both survivors of violence and perpetrators of violence in their everyday lives. And this produced a, 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 a change that's so fundamental in their relation to the problem of violence that, that a whole lot of other reorganization in their, in their thinking and reaction happened. And one of the things that it meant is that they were able to let go of the kind of the, the, the punitive, reactive, hostile, aggressive responses to their own feelings of threat, that they, they no longer wanted to engage in, in acts of xenophobic, homophobic violence, they no longer wanted to use coercion in their sexual relationships, they no longer believed that it would be necessary for them to use things like corporal punishment in child rearing. A, a fundamental set of questions started being um, um, changing who they actually felt they were.
um, in, uh, uh, as citizens of a violent society. And it seemed to me that this, that this was really interesting because I hadn't thought that this was going to happen. And yet noticing that it was happening seemed to open up something fundamental in the whole project of engaging in, um, in violence prevention activity. Because usually when people engage in, in, in violence prevention education, focus on a certain kind of skills training. They focus on things like conflict resolution skills training. Um, or if they, if, if, if the other kind of academic uh, angle can be of, of, of looking at, at what kind of measures can have been assessed to be effective on a social scale. And, and this was doing something completely different to that. Um, it involved a way of engaging people at the level of their identities as, com as, 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 as bridging the role of perpetrator and victim on a whole lot of kind of micro and violences and in some cases acts of criminal violence. Um, and it seemed to be that that, that, that that shift, that identity shift was actually the thing that seemed to produce the kind of promise of an effective intervention. And the idea that, that the, of, of simply going in either with skills training or providing more adequate data and theoretical interpretations actually was not um, particularly effective um, in the absence of, of a kind of emotional transformation process. Um, and that the core triggering um, uh, element of that emotional process was the recognition of themselves as having experienced multiple forms of violence, many of which were not classified to them uh, and recognizable to them as violence when they were happening. And by going through that experience um, and then recognizing their, 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 their role in perpetuating those forms of violence and then also conceptually linking those to the escalating forms of things that are identified and classified as criminal violence, it seemed to be, to be there that the fundamental shift um, uh, towards not simply creating people who were experts in violent reduction, but people who were citizens, who would participate in society in a way that wouldn't, that wouldn't um, perpetuate the, the, the forms of normalized violence that are then linked to the forms of criminalized violence. Um, and that was really the discovery that is the, the, the basis of a, a kind of a new line of work that I'm now exploring. Okay.